So, you know, as a, as a patient that's dealing with an AVM, uh, the first and most important thing is we're dealing with a complex problem. Probably one of the more complex issues that we deal with in neurosurgery. So I always try to keep things simple uh, and uh, the simpler you make it, it becomes a lot more easier for patients to synthesize all the options that are available. Um, so first of all, what is an AVM? What should I do? If my AVM comes out, will it come back? What are the risks? Who are the people involved? Uh, because it's usually a team effort in these cases. And what are my options? So these are just a few questions and I've dealt with so many of these questions and I've uh, realized that uh, you know, we, when we have these discussions with patients, it's, it's best to get them all uh, packed into something very simple so they can, they can process it, uh, not only for themselves, but also for their families. So let's start with what is an AVM? An AVM is an abnormal group of uh, blood vessels, just like you see here. The red here that you're seeing is an artery that lies on the surface of the brain. And the blue is a vein that takes blood away from the brain. So the heart pumps uh, blood to the brain and then there's a drainage system that takes the brain, the, sorry, the, the blood away from the brain. And normally you have what's called a, a marriage between the artery and the vein and what's called the capillary phase where the nutrients and oxygen are dropped off to the brain for it to be utilized and uh, all the debris is carried away from the brain. So that's normal, normally what it looks like. When you have an AVM, you have this abnormal tangle of blood vessels that are quite enlarged and engorged, and they can come in various shapes. Um, and this can be located deep within the brain or on the surface of the brain. So it, it varies amongst uh, patients. And when we are talking about, I'm just gonna minimize this real quick. When you, we are talking about a nidus, we're talking about this part of the AVM. This is called the nidus of the AVM. This is the arterial part of the AVM. This is the venous part of the AVM. And you're going from a high flow system to a low flow system. And later on, you'll understand why that's gonna be important. So when an AVM develops on the brain, what makes it dangerous? The, the biggest danger for an AVM is bleeding. Bleeding is the... Uh, uh, most dangerous uh, uh, issue with an AVM, uh, especially when you uh, don't know it's there. And the bleeding can come from many sources. It can come from these kind of bubbles or, or berries that form on the wall of the aneurysm, sorry, of the AVM called an aneurysm. Sometimes it can form from a rupture within one of these tangle of uh, vessels, which looks like a, like a clump of spaghetti almost. And when the AVMs bleed, that accounts for about 1% to 2% of all strokes, and about 3% of strokes pretty much in young adults. And when a bleed happens, it presses on parts of the brain, and the oxygen can be delivered to that part. And as a result, the brain suffers an insult or a stroke, and sometimes even more than that. So uh, this is the main issue when we're dealing with AVMs that rupture. Um, an AVM happens in about one per 100,000 population. Um, it's very different than aneurysms, which can happen in one in 50 people. So AVMs are not that common, uh, but when they do happen, they, they come to our attention very quickly. Because like I said, these are, these are things that are uh, very quickly transferred to our facility or any uh, tertiary care center that can handle these issues. It's about 4% of all brain bleeds. Um, much more common in adult patients are hypertensive bleeds. Uh, it's about a third of all pediatric brain bleeds. So, you know, we have a lot of uh, AVMs that have come to our facility. And what we uh, learn, know about AVMs is that when you have an AVM that's bled for the first time, there's a 10 to 15% chance that you can die from that. Um, and if you do survive that bleed, there's a 30 to 50% chance that uh, uh, you will have some neurological deficit. So uh, that, that uh, is still you know, a fairly high number. Uh, this actually hit very close to home for me. I live in Tampa and I practice here. Um, this was a, a young teenager, a healthy 16 year old uh, star football player, as you can see in those pictures, uh, who, was, who, who just uh, dropped in the middle of uh, playing his game and had a massive ABM and unfortunately couldn't be um, saved and, and died from it. So. Um, you know, these things, and you can, you can imagine he's a healthy 
uh, kid. It just goes to show how devastating this can be uh, when it's uh, strikes at uh, just really any any point in your lifetime. But uh, most aviums do occur in young adulthood. They don't occur in children mostly. Um, there's no real uh, uh, sex predilection, and uh, if you have certain genetic variations like the, the RASA1 or HHT, hereditary hemorrhagic tail endectasia, your uh, risk is uh, slightly more higher than uh, an average person of harboring an AVM. These are just some pictures of uh, vascular malformations uh, in HHT that may have an association with uh, having a brain AVM. So when you have an AVM, what are the symptoms you can have? Hemorrhage, seizures, headaches, stroke-like symptoms are asymptomatic. Pretty much about 80 to 90% of the symptoms happen in these three, hemorrhage, seizures, and headaches. Those are the three main uh, reasons for why an AVM comes to my attention. Um, when an AVM hemorrhages, there's about a, when you detect a, uh, a hemorrhage or an AVM that's unruptured, there's about a two to four percent chance that that avium can hemorrhage in someone's in, in one year um, if you find an avium that has not hemorrhaged. If you want to roughly think about it in a simple formula, this is a, a formula that we use uh, uh, if you're 15 years old uh, and you have an avium that's detected, there's a 90 percent chance that that avium can rupture in that child's lifetime. So we use these numbers to really come up with some concrete plans. Um, as opposed to anything else. <clears throat> if you're 90 years old, then there's a 15% chance that this can affect you. So you can see the, the, the difference uh, uh, in making a decision with AVMs when it comes to a person's age. But in general, when you're younger, we tend to be more aggressive. Uh, seizures. Seizures are another, it's basically um, the brain being irritated in, in many ways, and that causes a, a seizures and an abnormal electrical activity in the brain. Headaches are uh, a third most common of symptoms, about five to 10% of cases. And uh, stroke symptoms, these can be very varied. They can be a facial droop, they can be weakness, they can be trouble speaking. It can be sometimes associated with a seizure. Um, sometimes it can be associated with a headache. They can have visual disturbances that come and go. And uh, sometimes we attribute that to what's called a steel phenomenon. When the, AVM, when the AVM is very large, remember it's, it's, a, it's a high pressure system going to a low pressure system. And the blood vessels that are involved in that tangle is stealing blood from other parts of the brain to keep going. Uh, so you could have someone just uh, you know, lose consciousness or, or just have a sudden loss of words or, or have uh, trouble remembering something, may have a slight headache. So these can all be very, very um, subtle symptoms, but if they're very persistent, uh, it will lead you to see your physician or your neurologist, and and uh, if the avium is detected, then 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 eventually you'll come to see a neurosurgeon. And sometimes they're just found by accident. Um, you know, sometimes we have kids that fall down and bump their head, and they get a scan, and they find an AVM. It can even happen in young adults, but that's about five percent of cases. It's not quite common to find it incidentally. So what do you do when you uh, find an AVM? This is an example of a CT scan. This is a uh, non-contrast CT scan you see right here on the left. This is the, uh, this white area is the bone, a CT scan just for the audience. This is, uh, this is the nose here, the front of the head, the front of the face. This is the back of the head right here. And this is where the right ear is gonna be and this is where the left ear is gonna be. So a CAT scan and MRI, they basically uh, slice the, the, the brain like a loaf of bread so we can see it in different sections. This white area here is, is blood. Uh, and this is what it's supposed to look like. And this black area here is CSF, which is within the ventricle. This is a CT angiogram. You can see the difference. It's actually the same scan, but in this we actually give contrast into the vein to light up these blood vessels. And you can see an AVM right here. This is what an AVM looks like on a CT angiogram. And this is what a normal blood vessel looks like, this little uh, spaghetti noodle here. So uh, this AVM has bled in this patient, and this is what we see on the CAT scan. So uh, this person had some a change in his uh, mental status and got a CAT scan that eventually led us to diagnose AVM. 
what's next after a CAT scan? We usually proceed to an MRI uh, if, if the patient can safely undergo an MRI because an MRI is a, uh, a bit more time consuming and cumbersome to achieve than getting a CAT scan. A CAT scan can take just two to three minutes. Uh, a CT angiogram can take about you know, three to four minutes and you get your answers. An MRI can take about 30 minutes, sometimes even 45 minutes, depending on how many sequences you order. So this is an MRI, again, right, left. This is the front of the brain, this is the back of the brain. And you can see, this is what the normal left side of the brain looks like over here. And on this right side, you can clearly see all these um, black areas that have little circles in them. And that's that tangle of blood vessels that I was talking about, which is an AVM. And this is a similar, uh, this is the same patient with an MRA that is highlighting all the blood vessels that are lighting up. And they're all tightly clamped together, uh, which gives it the um, appearance of uh, the nidus that I showed you earlier in one of the slides. So that's, that's uh, the, the way we look at an AVM um, on an MRI. So usually when an AVM is detected, we have to, you know, eventually work our way up to the gold standard, which is the most important test, um, which is a cerebral angiogram. A cerebral angiogram um, uh, is most importantly an invasive test. So that's important to understand. The CT scan and the MRI, you just re require an IV line in your wrist and we can give you the contrast through there and it's quickly done. But for an angiogram, you actually uh, may or may not need a bit of anesthesia. Um, and uh, this literally involves uh, puncturing um, either your groin or your wrist, and a wire is sent all the way up your arteries uh, into your neck, and uh, we inject dye that way to get these, these pictures um, of the AVM in real time. It's a dynamic study, so you can see here, this is an example of an angiogram. This is, if you can imagine, this is the right side and left side. We're looking right at the patient. This is the right this is the right eye is going to be here. This is the left eye. So this is what the right side of the AVM looks like. You can see the blood vessel coming in here and filling up this AVM. And same thing we're looking at from the side now, which is called a lateral view. You can see the blood vessel coming from the neck, coming through the, the head. This is the carotid splitting into what's called the middle cerebral artery and supplying this AVM. Now, I'm only showing you one picture. This is actually a success, succession of pictures, um, which shows you how the blood flows in and how it flows out. It's very important to study this and you can only do this, uh, this type of sort of dynamic imaging on a angiogram, uh, which is done in the angi angiography suite, either by a neurosurgeon or an interventional radiologist or interventional neurologist, depending on your facility. Once the angiogram is done, we can actually take 3D models and really spin them around, look at it from different angles, and that becomes extremely important when it comes to surgical planning and also showing the patient what they are up against and, 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 uh, and to help them understand the anatomy, the location, and, and really get a good grasp of what the options are, that, the options that are available for them to uh, um, handle this AVM. So when you look at an AVM, there are basically uh, treatment options, which include surgery, embolization, and radio surgery. There's actually a fourth option, which is do nothing. You just don't touch the AVM at all. It's not listed here, but that is also an option uh, for some patients. So everything comes based on how we, we look at the patient's uh, um, overall health status and many other criteria, which, which I'll come to. There is an AVM grading scale. So if you think of it, it's very uh, easy to understand, grade one, two, three, four. Grade ones are smaller AVMs. And grade fours, you can see are much larger AVMs. And I'll, I'll show you this grading system later on to bring it all together to help you understand what each one means. So what if I don't want surgery? Obviously, you know, as a surgeon, that's, that's a common question I get. Um, then your options are, A, we don't do anything, or B, we try to do radio surgery, or we try to embolize it. Those are the, the, the different options which are not surgical, and uh, I'll go through that in a second. So if we have somebody that's in poor medical shape or has a very large AVM that technically cannot be operated on, then we just watch and wait 
take care of their medical problems and hope that the avium doesn't rupture and we educate them accordingly. So that's the one arm of AVM management um, that, that, that you can take. And that's usually a discussion between the physician and the patient after fully understanding what all the options are. I'm gonna start with stereotactic radio surgery. This is one option. It's basically where a frame is placed on the pa patient and uh, uh, radiation beams are uh, shot into the AVM. And uh, basically you're shrinking the AVM with the radiation, just like a, like a microwave AVM. And these are usually very, very effective for AVMs that are very small. That's, that's important to understand because if you have a large AVM, um, you can't be as effective because the, the radiation has a very focal point and the smaller they are, the more effective it can be. The disadvantage of radi stereotactic radio surgery is that it can take a long time for you to actually see the effect of it. So uh, there is no cutting of the skin. There is really no pain. Uh, you don't really feel anything, but once the radiation is given, you have to wait about a year or two, repeat the imaging to actually see if your radiation did take effect. So that waiting period can be very worrisome for a lot of patients because um, the whole time they're thinking like, oh, my goodness, my avian can rupture while I'm waiting. Uh, but that, that is an option for patients if they want to do the waiting, watch and wait uh, with stereotactic radio surgery. That's something that, that should be discussed very thoroughly. Another option is embolization. This is, uh, embolization has been around since the uh, 90s and it's really, really revolutionized uh, um, the way we handle AVMs and many other vascular problems within the brain. Um, what it, in a nutshell, involves is a, is a, uh, a, guy, a wire that is sent either through your groin or through your wrist, all the way up to your brain. And you can see the wire goes into the blood vessel and you can plug the AVM with uh, uh, material to stop the blood from flowing into the nidus right here. This is the nidus right here. And this is the draining vein that I talked about. So you can imagine all the blood is coming this way and going through here. So the idea is that if we can plug up all this, the AVM should technically not be alive and shouldn't rupture. Well, easier said than done. Uh, AVMs are very, very tiny vessels and um, uh, this it does require a certain amount of skill to get into those smaller vessels. The smaller the vessel, just like with surgery, it is more technically challenging and the risk is higher. This can be done with surgery or with stereotactic radio surgery. Sometimes we use embolization and mix them all together. We don't just pick one option and ignore the other. Sometimes they all are in marriage together and I'll highlight that in one of the cases coming up. The particles, the, the stuff that is used to stuff the AVM, it can be glue, it can be what's called onyx, or uh, rarely particles, this is mostly for tumors, but these are the two main uh, things. And if anything, onyx has kind of taken on the, uh, the, the front uh, row seat to pretty much most AVM embolizations that are happening nowadays in the country. The, uh, now you can imagine if you have a nidus that's this large and your onyx is taking out 50% of it, it makes it easier for myself as a surgeon to take it out because now I just am dealing with half of the avian that's alive with blood versus the whole thing being alive with blood. Um, is embolization always needed before surgery? The answer is no. Um, does it help? It helps, but it's not necessary in all cases because sometimes if the avium is small, then you can proceed with surgery even without embolization. And plus, in some parts of the world, embolization is not as accessible, and uh, um, there's also a cost issue, and, uh, and so all that kind of plays into, into the role of when people are taking care of AV, AVMs. The morbidity associated with embolization is about 4 to 11 percent, and you know, there's a, you know, if embolization doesn't go as planned, an AVM can rupture uh, on the table, and people can die. There's a 2 to 4 percent chance that you can die. Um, uh, from an avium rupturing during the procedure. Uh, it's no different than, than, than that slide I showed earlier about that football player just, just um, uh, dying from a ruptured avium. So they're very, very dangerous when they rupture. Uh, but usually these are done in the, in the hospital when a neurosurgeon is on staff or available, uh, and they can hopefully qu quickly take them to surgery and try to salvage uh, uh, the patient. There are some side effects uh, to embolization. This is just a couple. You can have uh, 
some um, alopecia from the radiation, there's some access issues, and just to name a few. So, you know, this is just an example of a young child that I'd seen many, many years ago with, uh, with navia malformation. You can see this is a CAT scan. This white area here is uh, one of the veins that's draining the AVM. If you think of this as a whole brain, this is pretty much the center of the brain. So it's a very, very dangerous area to, to go into as a surgeon. So surgical options are quite limited in, in these cases, but you can see this large circle right here uh, where the vein, the, the draining vein is located. This is an MRI looking at it from the side. You can see the nose here, the back of the head here, and this is basically smack up against the, uh, um, the brain stem. And this is an angiogram showing that very, very complex AVM, a uh, very high risk area for surgery. And uh, this child actually underwent embolization like I showed you earlier and unfortunately had this bleed. You can see all this white stuff. This is all blood that happened uh, about 24 hours after the embolization. So um, every treatment arm that's taken has a risk and it's very important for um, the patients to understand this and also for the doctors to communicate it clearly. So, so you know, we go into this with our eyes wide open, understanding that, um, you know, that the threat is real, um, but also take necessary steps to avoid um, such complications. So what about surgery? Surgery ultimately is curative because you want to remove the AVM and hope that it doesn't come back. But surgery is also not without risk. You can have bleeding, you can have infections, you can have strokes. Um, this is part and parcel of pretty much all the um, um, elements combined. Uh, but surgery, if it's, if it's done in a very methodical um, uh, fashion, with a very good understanding of the anatomy of the AVM, and of course, um, taking into consideration um, you know, your comfort level as a surgeon and your skill to handle these, uh, tackle these problems, then the, eventually the outcome will be as you uh, desired based on the data that's available in the scientific literature. So how do we grade AVMs? When we talk about, when we talk about um, AVMs, a grading system is good because, um, like I said, we want to keep it very simple. You know, a higher grade means it's more dangerous. A lower grade means it's much more easier to handle. So that's kind of the outset. So this is a Spetzer Martin grading system, which uh, came about in the 1980s, where if we look at size, venous drainage, and eloquence. You can get a total of five points here. Um, and Professor Lawton came out in 2010 with the supplementary grade, which is right here, where he added age, bleeding, and compactness of the AVM to uh, uh, be an adjunct to this scoring system. So if you have a score of one to three, you're at pretty low risk for pretty much any treatment arm, but majority of those patients will get surgery. Why? Because it's fairly easy to do surgery in those patients and they do very well, unless they have some sort of severe medical problem that precludes them from going to the operating room. Um, like severe heart failure, or they're unable to tolerate anesthesia, or their lungs are in bad shape. And so all these things have to come into play. Surgery does require you to, to be cleared uh, from an anesthesia perspective before pursuing it. If you have a score between four to six, then you're considered a moderate risk, and a high risk is between seven to 10, where you, know, you really don't want to offer surgery in these cases because the risk is extremely high, especially of uh, significant morbidity or even death. So that is a uh, um, clear distinction that has to be made. And this grading system helps uh, synthesize all the information I to told you to help the patient better understand uh, what the options are and what is the best course of action to take next. So this is an example of an AVM. This is an angiogram showing this nidus. You can see it's like a clump of, of really, really small blood vessels. And this patient is this, is, this is one of my patients after surgery. You can see the AVM is completely gone. So this is what you want your angiogram to look like after an AVM is resected. You want no evidence of any sort of um, uh, filling uh, um, of abnormal blood vessels and drain, things that are draining fast. There's no shunting of blood that's noted. So when we make a decision for treatment, we're looking at the lifetime hemorrhage risk. We're looking at the location within the brain. Is it near a part of the brain that is important for someone's vision? 
Is it near a part of the brain that is important for someone's function, their hand function or their leg function? Um, is it important to a speech area? These are what we call as eloquent areas because there's, if you take out an AVM and you cause harm to the patient, then you've really not done um, a, a good uh, a service to the patient because that's, that's not why we remove. We want to remove the AVM, but we want to preserve neurological function. Um, that should be the most important thing. And you should pick the option that will help you attain that goal or be as close to that goal as possible. And that's how um, I approach all patients that have AVMs. When you have a hemorrhage as the initial clinical presentation, these patients are at slightly higher risk for re-hemorrhaging, so we are much more aggressive with treatment. The uh, presence of an aneurysm is important because aneurysms have a higher chance of rupturing, especially if they're in the feeding artery, um, so we tend to be more aggressive with that. Um, whether or not there's seizures, if someone's having seizures from AVM, uh, then um, the, the chance of the seizures persisting is higher if the AVM is not addressed. Age at presentation. If I'm dealing, I take care of children and adults. If I'm dealing with a 10-year-old, my mindset is very different than when I'm dealing with a 90-year-old. Because if, if you've gone 90 years with an AVM in your head, you're in pretty good shape in my mind. There's no reason for you to uh, um, have surgery or really have any treatment because you've already reached a point where um, it's probably not going to change after 90 years. And there's no, there's no point in in chasing after that. But a 10-year-old is very different. You expect them to live for another 70, 80 years even. So um, that, 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 that paradigm shift is, is extremely important to understand uh, when we look at the lifetime risk of, of that AVM posing a problem to that child. Um, and if an AVM is causing ischemia or decreased blood flow by stealing blood from other parts of the brain, then we consider that for treatment. Overall, the annual risk of any AVM rupturing when they, when it just shows up with no bleeding. It's about 1% per year. The range is about 2 to 4%, but it's fairly low if you don't have any dangerous risk factors. Some of the dangerous factors are if the AVM only is draining deep, if there's been any previous hemorrhage, or if the AVM is deep in the brain or the brain stem. Remember, the brain is like a tree. If the AVM is out in the leaves, it's much easier to access, but if the AVM is close to the center of the brain where the tree trunk is, those are extremely difficult to access and very high risk. So um, we tend not to just go in there with surgery. We tend to uh, figure out a way with radiation. And if, if, uh, and if our hand is forced, then we have to do surgery in some of those cases. So if you have one of these risk factors on the right, your, your uh, risk of rupture is about 3 to 5% per year. If you have two of these risk factors, it goes up about 15% a year. And if you had three of these risk factors, then it's almost 30% chance of it um, hemorrhaging and posing a problem. Um, so these are just some miscellaneous factors that, that play into the role of when to take care of an AVM. What do you do after an AVM is treated? Irrespective of what treatment option you've chosen, if you've chosen to watch it, if you've chosen to embolize it, if you've chosen to radiate it, or if you've chosen surgery, these are the four options. Any of those single options or even a combination of those options, they have to be followed. AVMs should be followed pretty much um, for you know, a decade or two and even longer, depending on how your progress has been. Uh, I tend to follow my patients for, for a lifetime, some, and if they're doing great, even at five-year intervals, because there is a very, very tiny chance, uh, especially in children, as I've uh, quoted here, the five-year recurrence in children especially can be as high as 21%. So uh, that's, that's high. That means one, one in every five children um, will have a recurrence. So if you're a five-year-old, uh, your AVM uh, can come back when you're 15. So it's important to have that. I mean, doing a scan every five years is an extremely reasonable way to follow these patients. You don't have to uh, see them every three months, six months. You can, you can be a little bit more um, relaxed with the follow-up, but you have to follow them, especially if you've operated or done an intervention or if you're watching them very closely. So age is very important when it comes to decisions like that. Um, it can be done with MREs, CT angiograms, or cerebral angiograms. Remember, cerebral angiograms are invasive. Uh, so I tend to usually reserve that for the one-year follow-up and the five-year follow-up. I don't do them every year uh, because A, 
it's invasive, so you don't want to do an invasive test if you can avoid it. Our CT angiograms and MRAs are excellent uh, in their resolution and quality. So we get all the information we need from that. Uh, and I usually do that about six months to a year after surgery and continue that for five years. So the imaging can look like this. This is a patient that uh, we did about two years ago with an AVM, an 11 year old with an AVM that is receptive. So this is the angiogram directly after surgery. Now that I've seen this angiogram, I'll probably decide to repeat this angiogram in five years. Um, occasionally I'll repeat it in one year, but if the MRA looks excellent and I'm very happy with it, I'll save them that angiogram for way down the road just to make sure that nothing has recurred. And I'm especially doing that because this is 11 year old. Like I said, I, I wanna make sure that if it does recur, I catch it early and, and not catch it too late. This is an example uh, um, of an AVM that was resected. Uh, you can see all these little white dots here in circles. This is the AVM on the right side of the brain. And this is a six month MRA. You can see, you can see a, a normal blood vessel here, another normal blood vessel here, but where the AVM was located is just a cavity uh, that's filled with fluid. So this is a, this is a, I'm happy with this MRA it's at the six month mark. Uh, so I make the decision to see them back in about a year and do another MRA and just kind of keep watching it. As long as the patient, of course, has no new symptoms or any new um, um, uh, uh, neurological deficits, and that would obviously warrant another scan. And then we'll kind of escalate it from that point forward. So what do you do when you have uh, a family member that has an AVM? Uh, what about your kids? Um, what if your mom and dad has one? What about your children? What about my brother and sister? What about my cousin? There is no uh, data to say that you have to screen everyone. Uh, um, we, we, this is not really run uh, in families, uh, at least uh, the data uh, to date has not shown that. Um, and you really can't justify it unless you're having some symptoms that worry you. Um, getting an MRI or angiogram is really not recommended. If you have a her hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, that's different. Uh, those uh, children that are diagnosed with this specific condition have a slightly higher risk of developing cerebral AVMs. They can also develop AVMs in their lung and other parts of their body. Uh, so those children will probably um, screen them when they're about uh, uh, six months of life. And, uh, and adults will probably do them once. And if there's nothing in the brain, there's no need to keep looking. Because if you haven't found anything the first time, uh, it's very unlikely that that's going to show up uh, um, later on. If you're the extremely nervous type, okay, repeat an MRI in about five or ten years, uh, but that's even not recommended. But uh, you know, if you want to negotiate uh, with your patient and to make them feel feel at ease, I think that's very reasonable. And I've done that for one or two patients. So, what's it like living with an AVM? This is a very uh, um, um, difficult question because um, as a patient, when you have an AVM in your brain, you may be the type that gets nervous very easily uh, or you're very worried about it. Or you may be the type that's like, you know what, I have an AVM, I feel fine. Uh, I'm confident nothing will happen. Um, I, I've listened to my doctor and I think I'm just gonna, you know, do it, you know, live my life and move forward and not worry about this thing. So, you know, of course, if you have medical problems like blood pressure issues, you wanna control that. Um, you want to, if you have any symptoms, make sure you communicate that with your doctor or your physician and, and repeat your imaging. Your serial imaging will become key because if your avium is growing, uh, especially if it's growing with symptoms, then, then the pendulum is now swing uh, towards potentially considering a treatment option and no longer observing it. And uh, if you're having any sort of uh, seizures, uh, I usually get my neurologists involved because uh, the likelihood of you developing a new seizure um, when you've been diagnosed with an AVM is about eight to nine percent. So it's not very high, but that that uh, risk is always going to be there. So I'm going to show you uh, some some of my uh, uh, patients that I've taken care of over the years uh, who have had AVMs. This is a 56 year old male uh, who actually knew that he had an AVM. Uh, this is prior to me meeting him, who was driving down the highway and had a seizure. Um, luckily, he did not hurt himself or anyone else, uh, but uh, he was uh, quite uh, uh, perplexed by the entire sequence of events. And uh, we found this uh, AVM. You can see on this CAT scan right here, there's an AVM in the right um, uh, 
parietal lobe, and this is this is it over here, and uh, this is like the inferior parietal lobe, what we call the supermarginal gyrus. Now you can imagine this this is the whole brain. Remember I told you this is the center, and this is the outside where the leaves are. So this is an avium. When I look at it, I'm like, okay, this is something we can uh, potentially take care of. Now um, this is the angiogram showing the avium. You can see it clearly over here. And these are called diff uh, diffusion tensor imaging, DTIs, that give us uh, wonderful pictures of what the different pathways in the brain look like. When you're looking at the brain, you only see the brain, but you wanna see what the wiring looks like. You order diffusion tensor imaging, and I can predict very easily how close is my AVM to some of the important highways of the brain. So when I go in there to remove it, I don't wanna damage that part of the brain. So all these, in, all these pieces of, uh, uh, the puzzle will come together to help uh, not just the physician, but the patient understand uh, what the risks and benefits are for any treatment arm they choose. So based on the grading system that I showed you earlier, this is a grade three. So you know, grade three, you can make the argument, okay, a 56-year-old male, um, it's a modified grade seven. So that puts him at a slightly higher risk category for surgery, uh, but irrespective, uh, uh, he was a, uh, a smoker also. So we, we, had a, we had a long discussion. A, no surgery. We can try to uh, uh, radiate this and see if it shrinks because this has not bled. You had a seizure. You didn't have a bleed. So you have that option. Um, or the second option is we go and take it out, but the risk is higher considering what grade it is. Um, obviously, he was very, very worried about the seizure. He realized that he had a um, he was very lucky to be alive because he basically passed out uh, driving down the highway. He could have killed himself. And he didn't want to take that chance again. And he wasn't willing to wait uh, for radio surgery. So we eventually took him to surgery. And you can see here, this is the AVM before surgery. And this is after it's completely gone. He made a full recovery and, and he eventually uh, went home um, about uh, five or six days after surgery. And he's come off his seizure medication. So so that's the decision tree that we used in that case. Now we'll switch gears. This is a 16 year old. Now we're dealing with a teenager who came to me with just headaches. Um, our headaches were uh, pretty frequent and we found a grade three AVM. Now remember, the AVM I showed you earlier was out here. This is much closer to the, uh, to the middle of the brain, to the brain stem, what a part of the brain called the thalamus right here. So when I looked at this scan, immediately I'm thinking, well, there's a lot of things that can go wrong during surgery. Surgery is risky. And being a 16-year-old, her risk of hemorrhage is fairly high in her lifetime. So what can we do? Um, she was having headaches, so I didn't think watching and observing a person having headaches was appropriate. So I was like, I don't think that's a good idea. But I think we can radiate this. You're young and it doesn't hurt. It, we can radiate it and see if it goes away. And if it doesn't go away, we can always entertain surgery as you grow older. Uh, and she was a very healthy 16 year old. So this is a grade three AVM, modified grade five. So you can go either direction. Uh, you can radiate it and watch, or you can embolize it, radiate it and watch, or you can do embolization, radiation and do surgery. You can, you can kind of mix and match everything. Uh, but like I said, uh, uh, when I mentioned that for, for radiation, you have to wait about two to three years to see an effect. Uh, she was really not on board with that because dealing with the headaches for another two years was not something she was interested in. And fair enough, I said that, that was a reasonable approach to that. But there was a risk for surgery. In this case, you can see we did end up taking her to surgery. Um, this is just a picture during surgery. You can see this is the back part of the brain on the right side. This is the left occipital lobe, right? We go in between the hemispheres of the brain and resect the AVM completely. And you can see this is what it looked like before. This is what it looks like after, completely gone. And she made uh, a very good recovery. Now, this is a young man that uh, came to me in November 2018. Not came to me, he came to our ER um, with a, a bleed. So now we're dealing with a different situation. We have a, a young male that has had bleeding in their brain. So now there is no time to have a discussion or you can't have a very casual discussion in your office. You're dealing with an active situation. So it becomes a little bit more focused on how are we gonna take care of this and a little bit more attention is paid to the timing because when you have a patient that's bled, you wanna make sure that it's not gonna get worse and they don't deteriorate 
under your watch while you're there in the hospital. So this is, was a very large ABM. This is a, what, a grade four, some people even call it a grade five because it's in the corpus callosum, and a very high risk surgery case, so, uh, but a very young patient. And if he's bled at the age of 19, you can imagine in his lifetime it's going to happen again. Uh, he's at very high risk for it happening yeah, as a young adult or even into his 30s and 40s. So you know, we decided to, to uh, embolize him first. So this is uh, in uh, about uh, a, a month in December of 2018, we did the embolization. And uh, by January, about six weeks after his hemorrhage, uh, we took him to surgery and we removed uh, on the large AVM. I actually had to do the surgery um, uh, a couple of days apart because it just took, each one was, was so long, it took nearly seven hours for each one. So it's, it's always good to break it apart if you can't take it out, out in one setting. Um, he did have a very small part of the AVM that was still filling, but he made a very good recovery. And um, I had seen him back in my office. He walked into my office like nothing had ever happened. It was quite remarkable to see a 19-year-old just kind of bounce back from that like nothing happened. And uh, we talked about, hey, you got a little bit of a AVM here that can grow to this again. Um, how about we don't do a surgery and we, we, we zap it? And that's kind of what we did there. So, so just to close up, AVMs are complex lesions. If they're young, they usually require surgery. Um, it's imper imperative to refer them early so they get the appropriate surveillance and treatment. And uh, most importantly, you should weigh all options and ensure the best outcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Veronica, um, uh, my nurse practitioner, Katie, for helping me with the slides and uh, all the patients that have trusted me uh, with care of their AVM. And uh, this is my contact information. You can always email me and I, I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Haridas. Um, just kind of wanted to see if anyone had any questions. Um, we did have one in the chat. Dr. Um, D had asked, did he quit smoking? The patient that, I believe he was 56, that um, was a smoker, did he eventually quit? He did. He did. Yeah. Uh, he, um, I, you know, when you have an event like that, he, I think he even became more, he, he was driving, I think, 70 or 80 miles an hour on the highway and just had a seizure. Uh, and you could, you could see the emotion in the family that just to see him alive was, he could have just killed himself and anyone else on the highway. So um, I, I think he felt like he got a second chance on life and that, that can really change a person um, uh, from an event like that. So, and I'm glad that he obviously went through surgery well, but um, uh, you know, when you get a second chance, you, you, you change and now I'm very happy for him. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions you can ask in the group chat or you can simply unmute and ask Dr. Haridas as well? Anybody? Yeah. See Maggie? Um, yeah. Hi, Maggie. Yeah, I'm, hello, how are you? I'm doing um, very well. I'm, thank you. I had my AVM removed in February this year. And yeah, yeah, like your guy that was 56, I had seizures first. Okay. But I, I was having seizures maybe two to three times a day. Wow. Uh, and, the, and they didn't, they only started, I think I, I actually suffered from really bad headaches first. And okay. then I had, had a few blackouts. And then the seizures start then, maybe a couple of months after that. And I did have my, but they left me on the anti-seizure medication. And they said I would be on it for life because I had a hole in my brain now. Yeah. You know, every, every uh, when you're on seizure medications, it tends to uh, put a stop on a lot of activities that, especially driving. You know, mm -hmm. Every state has a different law uh, with driving. In Florida, I think it's about 24 months. And uh, places like um, Idaho or Rhode Island, like you can't drive if you're on seizure medication. So every state has their rules. But I tend to uh, uh, send my patients after six months to a um, neurologist to get an EEG. And if your EEG shows that you're if your EEG is fairly stable on two medications, then we try to have you come off of uh, one of them. 
and yeah. eventually you want to come off of all of it. So, um, and, and, you know, taking less medicine is always the best, but it has yeah. to be done under the supervision of a neurologist who can monitor your EG because um, if you bounce back and have a recurrent seizure, then it really has sealed the deal that you'll probably have to stay on that for life. Um, but, yeah. but I think, I think it's, it's worth, uh, as long as you're not driving and doing other activities, I think it's, it's worthwhile doing that under the supervision of your neurologist with clearly documented EEGs. And if you go six months to eight months without having a seizure, you're, you're seizure free at that point. Um, yeah, I'm seven months free now of seizures. My last yeah. one was the 18th of February. I had my surgery on the 24th of February and I haven't had a seizure since. Yeah, so so that becomes interesting because your avium is probably what caused the seizures. Now that your avium is yes. removed, logically mm -hmm. your seizures should abate, but your brain is recovering from the surgery. So usually after it's usually only after six to eight months from that point would we even entertain trying to potentially decrease the medications. Um, I don't really change the medication dose. I really rely on my neurologist because they're yeah they, they, they taper it down by depending on what your capra, they taper it down by 250 milligrams, um, um, and depending on what medication you're on. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm on the Keppra. At the moment, I'm on 2,500 milligrams per day. So that's a, that's a fairly high dose. So, you know, um, I think, I think uh, cutting that down by 250 to 500 milligrams would be a great start. Um, yeah. Especially, and then, and then you kind of, but it has to be done over a very long, slow process that takes time. If you're yes. impatient, then that's probably not the, the best option. Then yeah. doctors will not be on board. And you have to be just as a patient as a neurologist. Because eventually the goal is to get you off. And to do it properly, it takes a, a long time, but it's worth it. Uh, spending a year to come off your medications versus being on it for the next 20 years, to me, is, is, is worth it. So I, I highly recommend uh, patients going that route and eventually coming off any medication if they can. Yeah. But no, you, look, just, you look great after your surgery. That's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I got it from there to there. It was um, it was very deep in my brain. It was um, it was behind my emotion artery as well. Wow. So wow. it was about the size. Of, it was actually bigger. They thought it was a golf ball size first, and a lot of um, there was um, draining veins as well. But they were deeper in the brain when they did open me up, and they, it was feeding off my memory and also off my vision. But I do have a strange thing, doctor, and it didn't start until I had, until shortly after my first seizure. It's on my left nostril because it was in my right parental lobe. So they were afraid that it would damage my left side. Mm -hmm. But they have really bad sores on, in my, inside my left nostril. And they went away for about two months, maybe three months after surgery, but they're now back again. And I used to get them right in my earlobe as well, you know, in the top part. But they're not as bad, but my nose now, even sometimes just to even touch it. And I never had that before until uh, after I had my first seizure. So I don't know whether it's still related to the AVM, even though that he said, because I had another angiogram two days after the AVM was removed because he wanted to make sure he says, because there was so many small veins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, they were, it was, he's well, one of the, because I had, um, my neurosurgeon here in Ireland, but then he had a team from America over with him as well, to help him do my surgery. Okay. And they said it was a, it was just a tangled mess inside my brain. Yeah, I mean, you're you're very lucky. I mean, getting a team of surgeons involved in your care—that's yeah. always a. Uh, you know, uh, these surgeries can last all day sometimes, and. Yeah, it was um, ten and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Usually, when you get to the eight nine hour mark uh, i mean we're all human we get tired and that's uh, yeah. something that um, i tell trainees also that if you're tackling an abm you should be prepared to spend the whole day there uh, but also being very cognizant of uh, uh, knowing when to stop uh, because mm -hmm. you want it's it's best for the patient and for the doctor so yeah it's a two-way street you're both in there together and uh, i've done that on an occasion or two when when i thought it was necessary uh, just like mm -hmm. that one case I showed you with that young boy, we did yeah. it in two sittings. I just felt like it was too much for, for me to take on a one day and just put it in. He did fine. So that was the right mm -hmm. decision. But uh, knowing when to do that is tricky sometimes because yeah. uh, 
um, you don't want anything to happen while you're waiting, but I'm, I'm glad everything worked out for you. So it did work yes. out really good. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. you look great. Thank you very much. You're very Thank welcome. You, Thank you for coming. Um, we had one more question on yeah. the chat, Doctor. Um, Jenny says she noticed that you prefer to follow your treated patients. How often have you found a regrowth of the AVM? Um, I've found uh, so far, um, I've only found one regrowth in a child who was six years old, and that happened after uh, a year. So, uh, but I think um, that case was a little bit different because I think there may have been something on the post op angiogram that was suspicious, uh, but it was not worth um, uh, chasing after. And this was after she had surgery and we just brought her back a year later into the surgery. She's fine now. But apart from that, I have not had any knock on wood long-term recurrences. Um, but uh, the, the patients that have uh, done well, I, I, do I plan to repeat all their scans in about five years. And I think that's a very reasonable uh, 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 expectation from the physician and the patients are all on board. And after their experience of going to an AVM, they're like, that's it, five years, that's easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so they're, they're very much on board uh, uh, with that. And, uh, and, and, and usually once you cross the five, 10 year mark, um, I'm, I'm much more relaxed about their avium not coming back because that's a pretty long stretch to go yeah. without having any sort of recurrence. So it's very rare for an AVM. At least I've spoken to many surgeons around the world and, and they, some of them even do it 10 years in a row because they're so confident that it's just not gonna pop out of nowhere. Uh, or if it does, then the patients are pretty good about contacting their physician and getting back in touch, so. Um, one of the questions that I had personally was, um, how often do you see an aneurysm in the AVM patient? Like, is there a statistic out there? Is it, is it how common is it, I guess, from your perspective? Um, I can't pull out a specific statistic, but uh, I, I would say it's about you know, 20, 25% of AVMs have, have aneurysms. Uh, uh, and that does put it in a higher risk uh, category, at least the ones um, I've seen. Um, and uh, I think the longer an AVM is uh, present uh, in someone's head, the higher the chances of that uh, happening because the avium technically, if it doesn't remain uh, uh, quiescent, tends to grow and recruit more blood vessels. Um, and of course, if you have any history of uh, high blood pressure, you're probably at a higher risk of developing an aneurysm if it wasn't there the first time. Okay. But if that happens, then usually the, the treatment tends to be a little bit more aggressive because you don't want to watch that. That means not only are you dealing with an AVM, you have another aneurysm growing on top of that. Now you have two pretend, that's where it bleeds. And okay. those, those vessels are weak as it is, and now you have a weaker point that's bulging out. So you, you, you tend to be a much more uh, aggressive uh, and I probably call the I usually call the patient back and be like, I think we should treat this now. Uh, we're done waiting, or and then re reopen the discussion. Okay, thank you. And we we do have a few more minutes. I wanted to see if there was anyone else that did have a question they wanted to ask. I think I hear someone, or maybe it's her background. I'm not sure. Um, so I guess, Dr. Haridas, it sounds like you're open to emails if anyone does have another question. Um, and um, even from Jenny, she said, thank you very much for sharing your expertise. So I know we are very thankful for your time mm -hmm. and um, we very much appreciate it. So, and again, I will be recording this and posting this so others can see it as well. So thank you again. Thank you, Ronica. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Bye.